Hello and welcome to this design practice 2 module 20. So we were talking in the last lecture about the numeric valve design uh, shown and represented in this diagram right here. Some of the parameters that are there are this uh, that the micro valve has a circular silicon membrane and um, which acts as a valve seat. The membrane is about 20 microns thick which is given right here and has a diameter of about 4 mm 400 microns and the valve is normally open uh, with a gap of 20 microns. So, this distance right here is 20 microns when it is normally open between the membrane and the valve inlet. This is the inlet. So, I will just write the inlet channel here. This is the inlet. The idea is that this membrane will bend down as you are seeing in the dotted region here and will close the inlet so that the valve can come to the closure position. And you have to determine the pressure required for closing the valve at an inlet pressure of 1 bar. Uh, so, you are wanting to determine what is the pressure requirement on the other side of this membrane. So, that you know uh, a, a, a total pressure of 1 bar in, in inflow could be controlled, could be blocked. Given that the opening diameter is about 200 microns where this whole pressure is uh, being exerted. And we have to assume a distributed load on the valve membrane. So, we cannot assume a point load here. It is as if a, a cylinder is giving air pressure, okay, something like that. And uh, so, it is well distributed load on the whole membrane, the blocking membrane or what you call the valve seat. And you have a Poisson's ratio of about 0 0.25 and a bulk modulus of 170 GPA for silicon material through which this valve has been constructed. So, let us do some preliminary calculations. So, for a small deflection the spring constant of the uniformly loaded valve membrane is estimated as k equals to 16 pi e cube of t divided by 3 r square 1 minus nu square. I am just going to um, I refer the various terms here E is the uh, bulk modulus T is the membrane thickness and this is from standard strength of material uh, knowledge that the computation for K or uh, the, uh, the uh, solution for K uh, is being borrowed. R is the total radius of the membrane. So, I, I call this membrane radius and nu is the Poisson's ratio of the material in this case it is silicon. So, the Poisson's ratio has been given out to be about uh, 0 0.25 in this particular case and we want to calculate what is the value of k for this particular uh, problem. So, therefore, k comes out to be equal to 16 times 3.14 value of pi times of the total bulk modulus which is about 170 giga Pascals. So, I write it 170 10 to the power of 9 Pascals uh, times of cube of T. You know the thickness T uh, is given out to be 20 microns. So, we have 20 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meters and cube of T divided by 3 R square. R in this particular case is about um, 2 millimeters. If you remember the total diameter here is about 4 uh, millimeters as can be seen in this of the whole valve membrane. And so, we are going to go halfway when it is radius 2000 microns or 2 millimeters. So, we have uh, square of r which is 2 into 10 to the power of minus 3 square times of 1 minus 0 0.25 square as the Poisson's ratio. And this is found as 6.08 10 to the power of 3 Newton per meter. So, that is the equivalent spring constant that is 
found in this particular case for the silicon membrane which is going to be acting as a valve seed. So, let us assume that the micro valve is closed at an actuation pressure P act and this pressure per se falls on the top of this membrane. So, you know that the closure can only happen if there is some kind of a uniform loading and in terms of force per unit area pressure on the free end of the mem membrane or the uh, micro ball membrane. So, if you assume this area of the interface to be a m let us say the area of the membrane. So, we have p actuation on one side and on another side the inlet pressure. So, if we further assume the area of this opening right here to be a open, okay, we can have a force diagram of this particular system. So, the force balance on the membrane is P actuation times of area of membrane A m equals the inlet pressure times of area of the open channel A open plus the spring force that the membrane has to exert which is towards the opening side because obviously, uh, you are bend holding the uh, pressure inside this particular uh, pipe you know or in this particular inlet um, wing and for that whatever force is needed to bend the spring is going to give a reverse force as if the spring were open and it would try to close. So, it will give exactly k x force uh, where k being the spring constant. So, k has already been calculated in this particular case. So, let us calculate this uh, force balance equation for two different conditions one when the valve is in an equilibrium state and let us say we are talking about the equilibrium at valve closure and we can also find out the total amount of you know how this equation behaves at valve opening. Okay as the actuation begins. What is interesting in this case would be that both these values are quite dissimilar and one has to design for all this when you are talking about such a actuator design okay, which is going to do valve uh, valving okay, at this particular scale. So, case 1 is corresponding to when the actuation begins and case 2 is corresponding to when it is an equilibrium. So, let us understand properly what happens to case 1 that is when actuation has begun to happen actuation begins. So, you have a case where you have the p act on one side with the membrane radius and the area therein the area a m in this particular case as you may recall is given by uh, pi r m square where r m is the 2 millimeters radius of the circular valve orientation which has been defined earlier. So, this becomes equal to uh, that on the inlet side again pi r m square please understand when we are talking about beginning of actuation the whole inlet pressure is available on the lower side of the membrane because the membrane has not deflected or moved and so, the membrane is being upheld by the inlet pressure which gets into this particular channel and before moving out would create uh, through the Pascal's law an equal pressure in all directions. So, here the p i or p in times of pi r m square plus the spring force is what makes up the force balance equation. Uh, we can divide by pi r m square. So, we have p inlet plus the total spring force k x in this particular case divided by pi r m square inlet pressure being equal to 1 bar 
the spring force being equal to the k value times the total amount of deflection that it has to withstand which is 20 microns for opening to closing you have to cover this particular distance of 20 microns okay, divided by 3.14 times 2 10 to the power of minus 3 square. So, that comes out to be equal to about 109677 Pascals. So, this is how the beginning pressure is when the valve actuation has started. However, in this particular case you may observe that when the valve actually closes so much of pressure may not be really needed, okay. this is going to change when it is at equilibrium. So, the actuation force or the actuation pressure is going to be the highest pressure in this particular case. So, this gives you an idea of how you are designing a valve actuator. Okay. In the same manner I am going to do a few things you know in the next few minutes with you which talks about such actuation principles and designs. So, here in this case in case 2 let us say uh, when at equilibrium when the valve is in closed position at equilibrium the P actuation needed would be much lesser. Obviously, the fundamental that is kept intact here is that the spring force of course, is k into 20 minus 6 and the actuation force times of the total membrane area becomes equal to the total amount of inlet pressure times the inlet area which is only 0.1 in this particular case. Okay. Uh, you know that the opening dia here has been given to be about 200 microns. So, that is about um, 1 0.1 millimeters radius. So, let us put this value back here. So, we have 0.1 times of um, 10 to the power of minus 3 square as the force on the inlet side. Uh, the, you have to consider the valve in close position where the only exposed part of the valve lower membrane okay, is 0.1 millimeter uh, radius circle. Okay, valve inlet force. So, this plus the spring force which is in this case 6.08 10 to the power of 3 times of the total movement that has happened which is 20 microns. And in this case if I calculated what is the actuation pressure it comes out to be equal to 9.85 10 to the power of 3 that is about 9850 Pascals. So, it is very clear that actuation demands a lot more energy in this particular case than equilibrium and closure demands a lot more energy in this case energy is of course, given externally uh, by a mechanism which would exert pressure on the membrane. Uh, which will close the flow. So, it demands a lot more energy than maintaining the closed state. Here the total amount of pressure needed is about close to 109,677 Pascals whereas, in the closed state you only need about 9850 Pascals. This is true for all actuator systems that when we are talking about start of actuation which leads to a certain end effect, it is almost always that more energy has to be pumped in uh, the system than the end of the actuation. So, we will design the corresponding thermonumeric version in this particular case. I am going to twist the problem a little bit and uh, here what we simply say is that the valve described in the earlier example is designed with a actuator which is of th thermonumeric type on the top of the membrane thereby meaning that there is a cylinder on the top which has a fixed volume containment or a confinement and heaters which would heat the gas. And so, the gas inside the confinement 
would actually uh, follow the uh, Charles law of you know pressure being proportional to the temperature. So, uh, with the temperature rise obviously is going to uh, give more and more pressure onto the membrane thus deflecting the membrane and blocking the valve. So, in that event what is going to be the uh, temperature required for closing the valve ok. We will assume the same inlet pressure of 1 bar as earlier and uh, we can assume the initial pressure and temperature of the chamber to be 1 bar and 27 degrees Celsius respectively. Obviously, we assume that the chamber is filled with air and hermetically sealed. So, that there are no uh, heat outlets heat or work out uh, heat outlets from the system. So, assuming that in this particular case the chamber is uh, constant uh, the relation between temperature and pressure uh, if it is hermetically sealed and if there is no heat inlet outlet to the chamber except the heater which delivers the heat inside the chamber itself. So, you have T 1 by T 2 that is the temperature ratio between the initial temperature T 1 and the final temperature T 2 being proportional to the pressure ratio that is P 1 by T P 2. And so, therefore, the temperature that is needed for a pressure rise which is equal to the force needed for actuation in this case you already found out the total amount of pressure that is needed for actuating or start of actuation of the valve is 109677. Uh, this comes out to be uh, equal to the pressure ratio between uh, the actuation pressure and what it was earlier at the pressure was earlier at 100,000 1 bar inside the cylinder okay. and the earlier temperature was 300 degrees it has been mentioned here 27 uh, degree or 300 degree Kelvin. Okay. So, a total amount of temperature uh, that is needed for this process to execute the valve closure and then becomes about 56 degree Celsius or 329 Kelvin. So, that is how you design a thermonumeric system. So, there can be many uh, such forms of you know systems uh, which are used by various you know uh, different valves they particularly can operate on a lot of conditions for example there can be uh, as i told you thermomechanical valves there can be uh, piezoelectric valves there can be electrostatic valves there can be electromagnetic valves so on and so forth so we would now like to design another uh, set of actuator that is an electrochemical actuator uh, which would be playing the role of an electrochemical micro valve. Of particular importance here for me to tell you is that such valves are very commonly available within microflows and microfluidic systems because they are typically electrically driven and uh, it is always better from an integration possibility uh, into a chip scale. So, micro chip scale. So, this is what we want to do here. Uh, we have case 1 a certain layout of the electrochemical valve where there is an inlet of a flow coming from one end and an outlet going to this end. And there is a possibility of these electrochemical bubbles which are being formulated by hydrolysis of water. And there is a reaction element which is there where H 2 O is converted into hydrogen and oxygen gas and obviously, because there is a certain dissolution rate within the medium. Uh, which may be quite different than the formation rate and formation rate may be much much ahead of the resolution rate. So, whatever is not dissolved is stored inside the water as a pocket. So, it becomes a bubble. Okay. So, it is a two phase uh, bubble where there is a gas phase which is being surrounded by the liquid water uh, part of which has been hydrolyzed into the gas. And so, such bubbles uh, and the way that it grows or the rate at which they grow can be customized in a manner uh, which would lead to eventually the movement of this gate. So, for example, if these two bubbles right here are smaller or their growth rate is smaller in comparison to the bubbles which are at the back end here, then obviously, the gate will move forward. And supposing is the other way around that the two bubbles at the, uh, so in the close position of the valve the two bubbles at the front end are being 
created at a much higher rate in comparison to the bubbles at the back. So, it may lead to a reverse possibility that is the gate going back and allowing the flow to happen. So, this is one version. The other version could be in terms of a bubble which you are formulating in a channel. This bubble right here generated somewhere inside this micro channel may become so big that it starts blocking all the inlet from going through the small constriction which is there. So, obviously, the total amount of bubble pressure which has to be there <coughs> should be enabled to take the inlet pressure and still retain its property of being a bubble. So, one of the advantages that micro scale uh, flows have is a lot of difference in the physics, it is more surface based physics where effects like surface tension etcetera has a predominance over the volume effects like density pressure etcetera. So, electrochemical valves in that range work very well. And so, the whole idea is to design again an actuator or a valve which is based on electrochemistry as I showed you just above here in the two cases. Some of the parameters have been given. So, we would like to determine the energy required for generating an electrolysis uh, driven spherical bubble, bubble with an approximate diameter of 28 microns. And we would like to generate uh, this bubble electrochemically and compare it to the amount of thermal bubble uh, effort. You know, so, if supposing there is an equivalent bubble created by just heating and uh, vaporizing. So, what is going to be the difference in terms of energy in both the cases in the electrochemical as well as the thermal cases, particularly if the bubble were of the same size. Okay. Some parameters have been given here. For example, specific density of hydrogen and oxygen have been given at 1 bar pressure and 25 degrees Celsius. This is the standard temperature conditions, standard temperature and pressure conditions, STP conditions and they are 0 0.08988 kg per meter cube and 1.429 kg per meter cube respectively. Similarly, uh, component related to surface tension of the water has been given. So, it is very important to um, see what are the pressure differences which should be sustained by the bubble. Okay. Pressure differences between inside the bubble and outside the bubble. So, we will try to design it on that basis. Surface tension of water is given at 0 0.072 Newton per meter. And then we have some other parameters including enthalpy of formation of water, uh, which is actually related to the way that this electrochemical reaction happens. This is the enthalpy for this particular reaction and some thermodynamic properties of liquid water, particularly at the same pressure level at same temperature level. That is, um, you know, the total amount of specific volume or the internal energy uh, that uh, the bubble will have a formulated thermally. And uh, further these parameters that is specific volume as well as the internal energy are given at uh, the boiling point as well as the room temperature point. So, there is obviously going to be a change in these properties as the temperature goes up. So, given all these parameters, let us have uh, you know a discussion probably in the next module as to how do we compare uh, these two uh, processes in terms of the energy requirement, so that the actuation can happen electrochemically. And we would get an understanding, a fair understanding of um, you know the, the very fact that in electrochemical uh, you know actuation techniques, uh, the demand for energy may be much more in comparison to the thermal technique. So, uh, we will round off this module here, but in the next module we will try to do design of this particular valve. As of now, thank you very much uh, and see you in the next module. Bye.